So can you talk a little bit about um, how you feel about doing this? I'm extremely nervous. I've never been in a position where I have to kind of undress myself. I had a tough enough time when I first had to undress in my locker room in like middle school and high school. I didn't necessarily feel as confident about my body as maybe my classmates did. Transitioning from that to being comfortable and, and okay with my body took some time. What are assumptions that um, people have had about you based on your style? Through high school, I wore kind of like Air Jordans, Nike Dunks. As I got further downtown on the train, I realized that if I was wearing jeans and sneakers, people would kind of like clutch their purses a little tighter and kind of shy away from me a little bit. Uh, but that wouldn't happen when I wore a collared shirt and a blazer and, and, you know, and slacks. When I'd get to school, it's like I wasn't preppy enough or I wasn't fully there. But then when I'd get home, like why am I wearing collared shirts? Why am I wearing um, a tie with like jeans and, and I just got stuck in this really weird, um, weird in between. And I, and I think that gradually I just became really comfortable with that style and I began to really just enjoy, you know, what I, you know, what I wear. I can kind of draw from both and I'm not stuck in, in, in one of the two. I'm from the Bronx, New York, born and raised. I grew up in housing projects. My parents are Dominican immigrants. I grew up with like old school bachata in my in my living room and and dancing with my like with my stepsisters and and my mom. Later on, when I started going to school in Manhattan, that other thing that I could attach myself to was the Bronx because everyone, for the most part, at my school was from Manhattan, Upper West, Upper East Side. When I was at school after classes had ended, I would see you know various like black women in the lobby kind of waiting and at first it was kind of like okay like what is what is going on I know n very few of my classmates are black so why are there so many black women here and it turns out they were kind of nannies to to these um, to these kids and for so many students there the interactions any significant interactions that they had with people of color were it's people that kind of worked for them for me it was like as people that are my equals in the community and having that sort of power dynamic is very different not seeing people that look like me in positions where they have authority and like they in, in positions where they can do good and that hurt because I you know then I wondered okay what can I do what what am I destined to be a lot of what was really hurtful were the discussions my senior year for um, with regards to college applications we'd all be talking about okay did you get in here like where did you get in where are you gonna go and you know, so when I when I let people know where I got in or where um, other kind of black students got in, people were like, "Oh, it must be like affirmative action," and that just wasn't the case. Um, I got into to school on the merits of the work that I put in, when in fact I had to work harder. I felt like I always had to work harder than my classmates. I, I felt uncomfortable showing up late to class because I didn't want the teachers to have this sort of perception of, oh, he's black so he shows up late to class. And even if they weren't like explicitly racist, I was conscious of all the stereotypes that, that people have of black folk and I constantly felt like I had to fight against it each and every day. I can only work to discredit like my race or my identity or whatever it is. No matter what I do, it will never be a credit to that. It only works like it, whenever I mess up, that's kind of when I get caught. Um, so I always you know, tried really hard to, to not slip up in any way. And that's just an assumed pressure. <laughs> there was uh, this club that I was co-president of my senior year. It's called Jama, and it's a student of color affinity group. And every so often there was a discussion about, okay, like why can't, um, you know, white kids go to Jama? Why can't we join in? We want to be part of the conversation too. And, you know, I understood that, but it wasn't a genuine request. It wasn't a genuine attempt to, to start dialogue. It was just they felt the, that they needed the right to be somewhere where they weren't allowed. And, you know, it was kind of weird because Collegiate for so long had been like a club for white boys. And there were maybe five black kids in my grade out of like 55 or 56. And, you know, they joked that, you know, you know Jamaa plot is plotting to take over the school. Why, like, why are we being excluded? Like, what's going on here? What am I missing out on? This is making me feel really uncomfortable. I'm not used to someone saying no to me. And I was just kind of like, no, I just want to be around other black kids for like 10, 20 minutes during the day and, and really kind of decompress. Well, I, I want to ask you, I have to, so how did it feel for you when your dad got deported? I woke up um, and I was getting ready for school. And then eventually I heard some, some knocking on the door 
um, and I go to check the apartment door and I see these these two officers of some sort with their badges and they're you know saying like we're looking for Rafael Ramirez they put him in handcuffs um, they said oh you'll see him like later today like while all this was going on I had to translate for both parties because my parents don't speak English that was kind of like weird that I was like translating my father getting deported as it was happening my dad was a, a taxi driver and you know he'd never broken the law I don't even remember him ever getting like a parking ticket he was super anal about that kind of stuff and really careful the first like a week or so there was kind of this hope okay he's like being held here like he's coming back like you know we put money in commissary because he was being held somewhere and then it slowly kind of hit that he just wasn't gonna come back um, and that was also one of my first exposures to the prison industrial complex here like for as far as private prisons go more than half of the money that private prisons make are on holding people that are about to deport be deported um, which is something that I learned recently, but now connecting it back to that experience like really hits home. And that was something that I didn't tell the vast majority of my classmates ever. I was embarrassed, you know, and I was kind of ashamed, even though it was through no fault of my own. I just felt like there's this stigma that comes with deportation that I think that anyone who gets deported is a criminal, and that's just, that's not the case. In high school, I never invited one of my friends to come to come home. I lived in the projects. Projects are kind of run down and really shitty um, across the board. Um, you know, the elevators didn't really work. There was urine in the stairwell. Um, it was kind of scary to get home if you got home too late at night. And then you go inside the apartment buildings and they put uh, metal grates over the light fixtures. And it's kind of like, okay, like, you know, I really feel like I'm in a, I'm in a prison. Um, and even the, the way that they're designed, they're designed to kind of have like small open areas in the middle and then like fence you in by virtue of having these tall buildings all around you. And you know, a lot of my friends had these really nice apartments, really nice um, townhomes, country homes. I didn't want students to, other students to, to pity me or see me as less than just because of, you know, what, what my home looked like. But my excuse was always like, oh, it's, you know, it's just way too far. It's like an hour and a half from school. Like you don't want to, you know, take a train for that long. It's, you know, there's no point in doing that. Can you just discuss Colombia, your experiences there? Colombia has been a really interesting, interesting place for me. There were a lot of times when I had to go back and forth between Colombia and home because my little brother was on break and someone needed to be there to watch him or, you know, someone needed to go to a parent-teacher conference and I needed to be there because I could translate for professors and, and administrators weren't necessarily understanding that I had to do those things, so it was tough for me to get extensions. I needed an econ textbook for one of my classes and um, I, it was really expensive. I couldn't afford to rent it or buy it. I went online um, to a Barnes & Noble site. I got a free trial of their, like, reader software and I just took a screenshot of every single page for like 400, 500 pages. Just having to do things like that was, was kind of frustrating and almost like soul crushing. And then recently there were actions organized at Columbia University, people kind of protesting or just being vocal about the things that have been happening with regards to Black Lives Matter. The schools just received it really poorly. Um, they either refused to acknowledge it or have called police on us. As college students, I think we're, we should be doing. It's like one of the few times in our lives where we have fewer responsibilities and we can take those kinds of risks and really define who we are and stand up for what we believe in. They're kind of not letting us do that. They call the police, <laughs> and it's kind of not like campus police, but they call like NYPD. There were NYPD vans in the area kind of like roaming around, and it just kind of like blew my mind. We're Columbia students. What are we going to do? We're not gonna like do something terrible to destroy the school. Every action that's, that's happened has been non-violent. No one's gotten hurt. There's no intent of hurting anyone. The whole point of affirming that, that Black Lives Matter is that lives matter, that we don't want more people to be dying. Why persecute people for exercising their right to free speech? And all that does is it inspires a lack of trust and a lack of, of accountability. You look at even recently, there was this whole talk about an anti-terror unit that was designed specifically to deal with protesters. What? <laughs> with Millions March, interestingly enough, they had all of our Facebook profiles, the organizers' Facebook profiles, open up, opened up um, at NYPD headquarters when we were telling them what the route we wanted to, to take was. So they're sending people to infiltrate 
these marches and really disrupt things and, and turn them into something that they're not. This has become fear-based society and, and they are the biggest purveyors of fear that, that I know. I think I get a lot of, of my strength from my mother. She's one of my biggest mentors without even realizing it. Um, and that's not something that like I realized until just now. My, I'm, a, I'm a mama's boy. I love my mother. When do you feel the most vulnerable? I feel the most vulnerable when I'm at home. Um, there I'm surrounded by my mom, my brother. It's easy to get away from a lot of the issues and, and problems when I'm not in my neighborhood, but then I come back and I see that, you know, the, the public schools that I went to are overcrowded, that ma maintenance isn't really done on the buildings, that there are like cockroaches and different sort of insects crawling around everywhere. And that's just kind of the reality for so many people. And that I know that it doesn't have to be that way. And I think that, you know, a lot of times in school when I lose motivation or I lose focus, coming back home would immediately fix that and reset it right away because I knew that, like, once I came home, I knew that's why I was doing whatever it was I was doing. The fact that the people in those communities are so strong and are such amazing folk and have and sacrificed so much to do just for, for one another and that there's still a real sense of community. And that's beautiful because even when, I, when, when I'm at school, um, it seems so cutthroat and people are really focused on just landing that internship, getting here, getting there, and like that next step. But there's no real sense of, of community or just those kind of relationships between one another. But when I'm home, I have that kind of to the, to the fullest extent. My successes are as much my own as they are everyone else's in that building. I remember when I got into to Columbia, my old elementary school held this like party for me. It was a room packed with people that I'd never met before who were just from the community and like were there to show me support. It's so special. I just don't want anything to happen to, to that space or to those people. Why is being black beautiful? <laughs> being black connects me to, to my culture, connects me to a group of people whose experience is struggle. And I think that struggle is such a beautiful thing because it, it pushes you, it challenges you, challenges you, it makes you grow. And I think black is beautiful because of that resilience. It bounces back, it fights back. Given my, my experiences and, and the things that I think I want to do, I'm gonna need that, that sort of resilience and that sort of strength. You never have to struggle or fight for anything in your life. And you know, how could you really know yourself? How could you really know what you are, who you are and what you're made of? And you know, that only happens when you're pushed and when you're continually pushed. Um, I don't think I'd be the person I am if I wasn't black. And I, I like the person that I am. Cool. That was, that was so scary. Much. That was amazing. Awesome. Oh.